Good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, the third and final in our TTAC webinar series, an introduction to infant and early childhood mental health concepts and practices. My name is Meg Beyer and I am the Assistant Director of Strategic Operations at the McSilver Institute for, policy, for Poverty Policy and Research. I'm sorry, I've said that so many times in the last three days. <laughs> one of, I'm one of the partners for the TPAC project and I'm really thrilled to be here with you all this morning. Uh, for those of you who joined oh, yesterday, um, we do apologize for the audio issues with the videos um, and are working on remedying those issues before we distribute the recording. So I know you're probably all eager to receive yesterday's recording and slides. Um, if you could just bear with us while we try and remedy some of the audio and visual issues that were associated with the videos that we played. Just a few logistics about today's webinar before our presenters begin. As we've done in the past, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted along with the slides to the TTAC website. We will be taking questions throughout the webinar and we ask that you chat in your questions using the chat box functionality, selecting the all panelists on the drop down. Uh, we will set aside time at the end of today's webinar to address these questions. And for folks who chatted in, we got a lot of questions yesterday um, and we weren't able to address all of them. So we might even be able to address some of those questions from yesterday's webinar as well. So thank you for chatting those in. Um, we also just encourage you to chat in questions throughout the entirety of the webinar. We're collecting them all um, and we will organize them so that we have everything lined up ready to go at the end so that we can address all of your questions. Um, for those LMSWs and LMHCs who are interested in obtaining CEUs, this is just a gentle reminder that you must attend all three webinars in this series in order to obtain your CEUs. Uh, further information will be distributed via email following the webinar series completion. And finally, towards the end of our webinar, we will be sending out the feedback survey using the chat box functionality. So my wonderful colleague, Kevin, who is managing the back end of the webinar today, will chat out the link to the feedback survey in the chat box. You'll see it pop up at the end of the webinar. And we just ask that you complete it. Uh, we appreciate you filling this out. It really does allow us to understand your experience a bit better and enhance our future TTAC offerings uh, due to your feedback. So with that, I wanna thank you all for joining us and I will hand it over to Evelyn Blank, my colleague, um, the Associate Executive Director at the New York Center for Child Development to get us started. Evelyn? Thank you so much, Megan. And welcome back, everyone. We're really excited to be uh, doing our third module here. And I just wanna say that we've been really excited by the participation and the kind of response from participants. So we've gotten a lot of questions and we will try and leave some extra time at the end to respond to all. And if we don't get to them, we will certainly respond to everybody that's chatted in a question. So we really appreciate the interactive nature of this and the fact that people are really bringing in up such interesting topics. So thank you. And um, my name is Evelyn Blank and I'm the director of the Training and Technical Assistance Center, otherwise known as TTAC. And the New York City Training and Technical Assistance Center is funded through Thrive New York City, and it's in partnership with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And TTAC is a partnership between New York Center for Child Development and McSilver Institute on Poverty Policy and Research. Uh, New York Center has been a major provider of early childhood mental health services with expertise in informing policy, but also supporting the field of early childhood mental health, both through training and direct practice. And our subcontractor and partner in this grant is the new NYU McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research. And they house the Community and Managed Care Technical Assistance Centers, which are also known as CTAC and MTAC. Um, they provide ongoing technical assistance and support with a focus on business sustainability. So I also just wanted to, uh, this is a screenshot of our website and I wanted to encourage people to go to our website to find out about upcoming events. We do archive all our previous webinars and also have a host of other resources. So we hope that you'll join us and become part of our learning community. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our co-presenters today, um, to Dr. Susan Chinnis and Dr. Gil Foley, both who are the clinical co-directors for TTAC and really help provide the vision and guidance around our ongoing uh, efforts and uh, training. 
Um, Dr. Foley is a longstanding colleague and a personal mentor of mine who I've had the privilege of working with over 20 years um, at New York Center for Child Development, where he serves as our consulting clinical psychologist and also a member of our professional advisory board. He's a professor emeritus of the graduate program in infant mental health and developmental practice at Adelphi University. Dr. Foley is also a retired tenured faculty member of Furcloth Graduate School of Psychology, where he taught for 20 years in the Department of School Clinical Child Psychology and also coordinated the Infancy Early Childhood Track. He was the director of a federally funded training and technical assistance project that prepared infant and early childhood professionals across the nation. Most of his clinical and teaching career have been devoted in large part to working with infants and young children with special needs and their families. He's also the author of several books and numerous articles his most current book is with Dr. Jane Hockman on mental health and early intervention, which is published by Brooks. And he's currently co-authoring a book on sensory integration and self-regulation in young children, which is going to be published by National Zero to Three in the near future. And I know that several questions that were chatted in yesterday really had to do with sensory processing disorders. I think this is gonna be a major contribution to the field. Dr. Foley lectures and consults widely. And Dr. Susan Chinnis is the other clinical co-director for TTAC, and she also serves on the New York Center Professional Advisory Board. She is a psychologist with specialties in the area of infant mental health and developmental disabilities in infancy and early childhood. She is the former director of the Early Childhood Center, the Center for Babies, Toddlers, and Families, and the Parent Infant Family Court Project all therapeutic programs for children birth to five years of age, which is housed at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, where she also serves as the Professor of Clinical Pediatrics and the Patricia D. T. and Charles S. Raisin Distinguished Scholar in Pediatrics. Dr. Chinnis is currently affiliated with the Center for Court Innovation, where she is spearheading the Strong Starts Court Initiative, an effort to integrate developmental science into family court practice for infants and toddlers. Dr. Chinnis is on the board of the New York Zero to Three Network, the Community Advisory Board of the New York City Nurse Family Partnership, the faculty of the Parent Infant Psychotherapy Program at Columbia University Center for Psychoanalytic Training and Research, and was previously on the local coordinating council for the New York City Early Intervention Program, where she, and she's also been a member of the Frontiers of Innovation Initiative of the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. She has received numerous awards in recognition of her many achievements and her outstanding work. So it is now my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Chinnis and to uh, finish up with our third module here today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Evelyn. Good morning and welcome back to the third webinar in our series on Foundations in Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health. Today we will continue to focus on risk to children's healthy social-emotional development. Yesterday, we highlighted the relational foundations of social-emotional development and focused on the risks that certain child characteristics bring to the parent-child relationship. Today, we will turn our attention to risks that the parent brings to the relationship. We'll also talk about the concept of cumulative risk, about children in foster care, and we'll end by discussing differential diagnosis, screening, and assessment. Before we get started, though, um, I just wanted to say that it has been a pleasure to interact with some of you a bit through the questions you have asked during and following the previous two webinars. It's helped us to know what's on your mind and what's coming up in your work. It's also underscored your efforts and your concern and compassion for the families you work with and has made us, all of us at TTAC, feel proud to be part of this dedicated helping community. Okay. Okay, I gotta catch up. Okay. So what makes people parent the way they do? It has been proposed that just as children have an attachment behavioral system, that emerges from constitutional and experiential factors, parents have a complementary caregiving behavioral system that also has a multi-factor foundation. Parents' caregiving behavior is influenced by the parent's own attachment history as a child, the cultural context, other demands on the parent, the support given to the 
mother or parent, the characteristics of the child, and the person's lived experiences as a caregiver. Contemporary theory suggests that parents' attachment history provides the base. So we'll talk a little bit more about attachment. As Gil said on Monday, there's a strong correlation between parents' attachment status as a previously cared for child and the attachment status of, of the parent's child. Parents who are securely attached as children tend to have children who are securely attached. And parents who have had insecure attachments as children tend to raise children who have similar attachment classification. However, the transition to the parenting role starting in pregnancy and interactions with the child provide opportunity for reworking internal models of attachment and internal models of caregiving. The birth of a baby has enormous power to evoke caregiving behavior and to catalyze the reorganization process. And I'll add, so does psychotherapy help with that. Just as there are categories that describe children's attachment, there are also research-based adult attachment classifications. Parents classified as autonomous tend to raise children who develop secure attachment. They are sensitive to their children's emotional needs. They're responsive and emotionally available to their children. Children who have secure attachments are thereby able to balance their needs for attachment and exploration and deploy their attention flexibly because they have learned that their parents are available, protective, and supportive to them and to their developmental efforts. Parents come to this attachment stance if they have sensitive and nurturing care as children themselves, or if they have come to terms with or reflected on their parents' deficiencies and have opted to intentionally parent their children differently with a focus on the child's emotional needs. Parents classified as dismissive avoid focusing on painful relational memories from their own childhood, or they insist that they had no effect. As a defense against their own unmet needs, they tend to reject their children's dependency needs and bids for comfort and reassurance. The child of a dismissive parent learns to turn away from his own internal distress and focuses instead on toys and the surrounding environment. This is a strategy that the child uses in order to maintain proximity to a parent who rejects their needs for nurturing. Though the child looks independent, there is evidence of underlying stress. And out in the world, the child often miscues others, like teachers or foster parents, to think that he or she doesn't need them. That somehow perpetuates the child's avoidance attachment classification. Parents who are preoccupied describe dissatisfaction with the parenting they received, but they remain caught up in their adverse early relational experiences. They tend to be inconsistently emotionally available to their young children and inconsistently responsive to their dependency needs. Sometimes they are available and responsive and sometimes they're not. Children develop anxious, resistant attachment. They seek comfort from the caregiver when distressed, but they're not readily comforted or reassured. Their attention is focused on the parent to the detriment of exploratory needs. They're watchful and wary about the parent because they're never sure when that parent is going to be responsive to them. Parents who are unresolved have often experienced early loss or attachment-related trauma such as violence or physical or sexual abuse. They have not adequately psychologically resolved these adversities and provide parenting that is frightening to the child or sometimes abusive. 
In essence, in either case, they don't protect their babies from psychological danger. Their own helplessness in this regard causes the parents to psychologically or behaviorally abandon the child, threaten him, or appeal to the child for reassurance. These are a parents' defensive reactions to the fear, helplessness, and rage that they experienced as children. The child thereby shows conflicted approach and avoidance behavior toward the parent. The child is trying to respond to the unresolvable situation in which the person who is supposed to nurture them is in fact a source of fear. This child with disorganized attachment has no organized strategy for resolving dependency needs and often shows symptomatic, unusual, or difficult behavior. These are dyads that need dyadic intervention as early as possible and often become known to the child welfare system. None of the attachment styles described suggest psychopathology, although children with disorganized attachments veer in that direction. But rather, these attachment styles are relational templates that provide protection or, in some cases, increase risk for psychopathology. As we said before, parents are developing adults and have potential to change their state of mind about attachment. Some parents reflect on their experiences as a child and commit to raising their child differently. And sometimes parents come to understand why their own parents acted in a certain way and resolve this for themselves. Sometimes new relationships, like new partners, provide modifications in people's internal working models of attachment and expectations of relationship. And as I've said before, psychotherapy can reshape parents' attachment state of mind. As we've said in both of our webinars so far, ghosts in the nursery is a critical concept in the field of infant mental health that describes how parents bring histories of troubled relationships in their childhood to their relationship with their own infant or young child. Clinical work with Nina's mother, in the case I described yesterday, uncovered a ghost in her nursery that was impacting her relationship with her daughter. Sometimes parents' ghosts or other relational experiences in the past result in negative attributions um, to their children. Listening with a clinical ear for old ghosts and for negative attributions often offer a clue to relational problems, especially when attributions um, defy uh, the possibilities imposed by the child's age or by the child's intentionality. Sometimes we hear children described as abusive, manipulative, the devil, or out to get the parents. Often those reflect early relational templates. Alicia Lieberman and her colleagues have more recently introduced the concept of angels in the nursery. These are memories of benevolent caregivers who did provide protection and nurturance, sometimes the parents and sometimes other people in the parents' life. These memories of benevolent caregivers can be used in psychotherapy to remind parents of the kind of caregiving they can identify with and aspire to. So implications for intervention thus far. First of all, parental insight into their relational experiences as children is very important. In CPP and other insight-oriented dyadic therapies, we encourage parents to reflect on their early relationships and how these may carry over into their parenting and relationship with their young child. In the case of Nina, patient and adequate attention to her early relational life permitted Nina's mother to eventually connect her parents' experience with a child with disabilities to her own and led to insight into the origins of her feelings toward Nina. 
In the field of infant and early childhood mental health, we also use interventions that promote parents' reflective functioning or their capacity to consider the feeling space that underlie their children's behavior and their own. For example, to appreciate that a toddler who's becoming dysregulated at the end of a supermarket line is exhausted after spending a full day of daycare. The parent who can respond to the child's feeling state rather than the behavior is showing reflective function. Increased capacity for reflective functioning makes parents more empathic to their children and more sensitive to their needs and is something that we work toward in dyadic psychotherapy. Okay, and considering risks that parents bring to the relationship, I'm going to turn now to a brief discussion on maternal depression, which is one of the most recognized risk factors for infant and child development. Depression in mothers of very young children is very common. The prevalence is somewhere between 10 and 20 percent overall. And the rate of depression is even higher among low income or poverty affected mothers of young children. In these cases, women are often struggling with histories of adverse experiences in their own childhoods, may have housing insecurity and other financial stressors, and are often contending with inadequate social support as they attempt to care for their children. Studies have found that in low-income samples, 25 to 50 percent of mothers of young children are struggling with depression. Symptoms of depression include prolonged periods of low mood, loss of interest and enjoyment, disturbances in sleeping or eating, irritability or agitation, problems with concentration, and or feelings of hopelessness. And though depression is treatable, too few mothers with depression obtain appropriate care. And fathers are often totally forgotten in the discussion of depression. Uh, although they often have often had very adverse life histories themselves. Depression is a debilitating disorder. Living with a parent with depression is particularly impactful for a child during the first few years of life due to the total dependence of the infant and toddler on his or her parent and the fact that this is the person the child is with most of the time. Depression affects mothers' energy level, motivation, sleep, and ability to experience pleasure. These may cumulatively make it difficult for mothers to maintain a basic level of functioning. In more serious cases, neglect may occur. Maternal depression can manifest itself in two types of problematic parenting patterns. Hostile or intrusive patterns of interaction that are fostered by a parent's irritability and negative mood, or disengaged and withdrawn behaviors. In either situation, though, there's disruption to the serve and return interaction that's essential for healthy brain development. The parent infant relationship is impacted, as is the child's neurobiology to the possible detriment of both the child's cognitive and emotional development. Fortunately, screening for maternal depression is increasing in a lot of child-serving settings. Sometimes dyadic parent-child therapies like CPP help to alleviate the parent's depression symptoms, but sometimes individual intervention for the parent is needed as well. Because of depression's pernicious effect on children and on parenting behaviors, a combination of dyadic and individual interventions may be needed to affect the best child outcomes. Okay, we'll talk a bit about parental substance use disorders. In clinical work, we often see high rates of child exposure to alcohol and other drugs prenatally and postnatally. Rates are even higher now with opioid addiction so widespread. Parents who have chronic substance use disorders often have co-occurring mental health disorders. 
histories of abuse and other traumatic experiences sometime in their lives is common. Their early relational trauma in conjunction with use, use of drugs or alcohol often result in a pattern of risky behaviors, impulsivity, mood lability, and ongoing relationship difficulties. Often parents experience guilt about the impact of their substance abuse on their babies, but they may also deny the impact at times. Overall, there's often very variable behavior based on stages of use and abstinence. Certainly when they are using, parents have difficulty reading their young child's cues, responding contingently, reliably, or sensitively, or establishing or maintaining routines. In the most concerning cases, there are significant safety issues related to neglect and a dampening down of the parents' protective behaviors. Overall, we find in clinical work that chronic substance use disorders are often a marker for social risk in general. Young children who have been exposed to drugs or alcohol during pregnancy may have a variety of symptoms that make their day-to-day -day care more difficult. Alcohol is a known neurotoxin, meaning that it has an established effect on the developing fetus. Fetal alcohol syndrome and fetal alcohol spectrum disorders often include physical, cognitive, and behavioral problems. Newborns who are exposed to opioids during pregnancy are often irritable with excessive crying. They may have increased tone or hypertonicity, making it difficult to handle them. Often considered to have neurologic fragility, these babies may show heightened reactions to sensory stimulation and may show state lability, meaning they quickly transition from sleeping to excessive crying or vice versa. Often there are difficulties with sleep and with feeding. Children with these exposures are at risk for developmental delays and emotional, behavioral, and attentional disorders difficulties as they get older. So with support of caring, the effect of opioid drugs usually fades, so the effect of alcohol exposure may become more notable as the child develops. The combination of a substance abusing parent and babies affected by these problems often result in problems in the parent-infant interaction, and clinical support is usually indicated. Sometimes children's emotional or behavioral problems reflect difficulties in their relationship with a primary caregiver. Relationship disorders don't result in specific child symptoms or behaviors. The child may have any kind of symptom, food refusal, aggressive behavior, fearfulness, oppositional behavior, will reversal, or any other symptom picture. Relationship disorders are considered when a child's difficulties are most pronounced with a particular caregiver and are not observed with different adults or in different settings. The infant-parent relationship needs to be a central area of focus for all infant and early childhood practitioners. BC 0 to 5 underscores relational assessment as a critical component of the diagnostic process. Okay, we're going to transition to um, some discussion of trauma, which is usually defined as an exceptional experience in which powerful and dangerous stimuli from the child's capacity to regulate emotions. It usually involves a real or perceived threat to the life or physical integrity of the child or someone close to the child. Most importantly, it's characterized by excessive fear, terror, and feelings of extreme helplessness. Examples include car accidents, fires, animal attacks, natural disasters like hurricanes, floods, and earthquakes, home invasions, police raids, and terrorist attacks as examples. 
The primary result of exposure to a traumatic experience is the activation of the child's fear stress system. Following exposure to extreme threat, the child becomes hyper alert or hyper vigilant to signs of danger and may perceive danger even when it doesn't exist. Often the child who has had such experiences shows increased levels of arousal. For example, he may have an exaggerated startle response, have difficulty concentrating, or experience difficulty sleeping. She may so show signs of re-experiencing the traumatic event either through nightmares or traumatic play in which the scene is repeated over and over. Many of you will remember how parents and teachers reported that young children crashed planes or other objects into towers after 9-11. This is an example of traumatic play. Young children may also show new fears of things or events that did not frighten them before, and many have increased anxiety about separation from parents. Children affected may actively avoid places or people associated with the event, and some children show regression in their developmental competencies, for example, in the areas of toilet training or socialization. We make the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder if symptoms like I've just described have been present for at least one month after the event. When a child experiences a traumatic event that has the benefit of a sensitive, nurturing, and attentive caregiver, the child will most often be able to cope with and recover from the incident. Supportive adults help to buffer the impact of trauma and can usually intuit what the child needs in terms of emotional support. Children with secure attachments, therefore, have better recovery from traumatic events than children with anxious attachments. Often, however, when a child has endured a traumatic event, so has the parent or caregiver. In such cases, the parent may also be struggling with the after effects of a traumatic experience and may even temporarily be diverted from the child's emotional needs by their own struggles. In such cases, intervention may be provided for both parent and child with the expectation that their positive and attuned relationship will be restored. The children that we worry about the most are children with a form of trauma that's called complex trauma. Complex trauma is described as early onset exposure to multiple chronic and prolonged traumatic events of an interpersonal nature. These exposures to adversity occur within the child's early caregiving system and are perpetrated by the people who are supposed to be a source of safety and protection for the child. Circumstances such as chronic neglect, physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, or exposure to domestic or sexual violence all constitute traumatic events imposed on the child by the people who are supposed to love and protect them. And these types of traumatic experiences often co-occur so that children are exposed to several or many of these forms of trauma, often over long periods of time and during their earliest and most formative years. These constant assaults without the buffering of a protective adult results in the chronic activation of the brain and body-based fear stress system. The fight or flight response that in typical situations prepares us to cope with imminent danger does not have a chance to resolve when the source of danger is part of the child's everyday life. The constant production of stress hormones and the frequent deployment of this fear-based brain circuitry results in a fear stress system that is very easily triggered and very hard to turn off. Repeated traumatic experiences of this kind create brains that are braced for danger 
and ultimately the child loses the capacity to differentiate between threat and safety. In the field of infant mental health, the term toxic stress is used to describe the dual situation of exposure to trauma or adversity without the buffering support of a nurturing caregiver. It is toxic in a literal sense in that it negatively affects brain development and in the long run also impacts physical health and in most cases well-being throughout the lifespan. And very importantly, interpersonal traumas wreak havoc with children's attachment system. Unable to find solace in their relationships with primary caregivers, children learn to withdraw from social relationships, they dampen down their dependency needs, or they attempt to attach themselves to anyone they encounter. The impact on a young child of interpersonal traumas is so profound and pervasive that some experts in attachment and trauma advocated for, classification, for the classification of tra uh, developmental trauma disorder, liking in this way to other developmental disabilities or disorders. Because complex trauma is known to affect so many different domains of functioning, including attachment and biology, meaning primarily somatic or body-based symptoms, affect and emotion regulation, cognition, self-concept, and worldview. Symptoms of complex trauma in very young children sometimes include developmental delays, withdrawn behavior, indiscriminate attachment in which a child will go off with kind of a stranger, easily elicited frequent, severe, and prolonged tantrums, inconsolability, difficulties with sleep, often aggressive behavior, sometimes sexual play or behavior, often regressive behavior or loss of developmental milestones, sometimes self-injurious behavior, sometimes hyperphagia, which is an eating disorder or other eating disorders, and often negative mood and difficulties getting along with other children. In terms of intervention, removing a child like this from immediate danger is of course necessary, but often not sufficient. Removing a child from danger does not in itself reverse or eliminate the fear response. Many events have occurred even before the child had language, and memories are more implicit or body-based and may not be accessible in a narrative form. Reducing the child's fear responses requires a lot of work and evidence-based treatment. It needs to include the child's primary caregivers who have to shape different expectations of relationships. Relationship-based interventions for children like this are essential. This can sometimes be difficult because the child is often difficult to manage and doesn't readily accept nurturing behaviors. Caregivers of these children need extensive psychoeducation and support to stick with this over the long run. Okay, um, we are working our way to this discussion of cumulative risk. So earlier research taught us this. The ACE studies have decisively underscored the adversity of cumulative risk. Cumulative risk is the presence of multiple types and sources of risk factors. Research has shown that there is an incremental and progressive impact on outcomes of multiple risks that co-occur at any one time or over the course of a lifetime. It is currently our understanding that the number of risk factors that impact an individual is even more significant than the nature of any particular risk factor. Poverty is the single 
biggest risk factor for children's development, as it is an umbrella under which many other risk factors co-occur. These include insecurity in having basic needs met, such as for food, shelter, and medical care, increased parental stress, distress, and mental health problems, increased risk for family conflict or violence, poor quality of child care, and sometimes poor quality of school. Parents who have had early relational adversities or adverse childhood experiences also usually incur situations of cumulative risk for their children. Uh, as we mentioned, they might get involved in substance abuse, they may struggle with depression, um, they may have a lot of interpersonal difficulties. Uh, we've covered the cumulative risk posed by complex trauma. Chronic neglect often has impact on children's health and education. It certainly has impact on their formation of attachment and of trust. Uh, parent incarcer parental incarceration similarly usually involves an attachment disruption for a child, sometimes changes in caregiver, often a loss of family income. And depending on the circumstances that led to the parental incarceration, there might have been traumatic exposures to arrests, police raids, or, or similar things. Certainly foster care, uh, which we'll turn to next, is a good example of children who face cumulative risk. Young children in foster care are the most vulnerable group of children. Certainly, they carry a very high burden of toxic stress. Many infants are removed from their parents due to prenatal exposure to drugs or alcohol, or if they're not removed from this for this reason, this is often part of their history, so that the adversities they experience are often superimposed on a substrate of neurobiological vulnerability. Many have experienced neglect physical or sexual abuse, or exposure to violence. Removal from parents, even when it's necessary to ensure a child's safety, is a trauma for a very young child. And it's important to note that young children experience loss, even when removed from an abusive parent. The adversities that a child contends with in the care of a parent with substance abuse or mental health problems prior to the removal may have resulted in the development of insecure or disorganized attachments, and now the child has attachment disruption in addition to attachment disorders. In the context of removing infants and young children, often done because of concern about imminent risk to the child, it is easy to forget that the loss of a child's primary relationship can trigger grief and bereavement in a child too young to understand where his parents or siblings are or when he or she may see them again. In addition to this initial loss, the long time to permanency and the multiple moves in care that are more common than not create repeated attachment disruptions and loss for a child who's entirely dependent on his or her relationships for a sense of safety and security, and ultimately for his sense of himself and of others. Visits with birth parents can trigger this loss over and over again as the child is reunified and then has to separate again from the parent. Or visits can be trauma triggers, reminding the young child of things that he or she was exposed to while in the parent's care. Some children in foster care have had so many caregivers that his or her history is hard to reconstruct, and there, and there may not be knowledge or documentation of all that has happened to the child. In a national survey, 38% of infants and toddlers in foster care had experienced four or more adverse childhood experiences by the time they were two years old. And we'll remember that four or more is the threshold at which we begin to see increased prevalence of so many mental health and even physical health disorders. 
It's not surprising then that young children in foster care have very high rates of medical and health problems, high rates of developmental delays, and high rates of emotional and behavioral problems often related to these multiple attachment disruptions and exposure to traumatic events. Among children in foster care, we see many kinds of emotional and behavioral problems. Certainly, there are high rates of attachment disorders and traumatic stress disorders characterized by emotional and behavioral dysregulation, frequent and severe tantrums, irritability, aggressive behavior, socially withdrawn behavior, or indiscriminate friendliness to strangers. Many children present with deprivation-related behaviors, including hyperphagia, which is excessive eating and hoarding of food. And children in foster care probably compromise the largest cohort of children who meet the criteria for complex trauma. Therapeutic work with young children in foster care must address their attachment disruption, and it must address their traumatic experiences. Therapeutic work with young children really must be dyadic and include the child's primary caregiver or attachment figure. It should offer psychoeducation to foster parents on what the origins of the children's behavior is so that they can engender a more empathic approach. Therapeutic work may need to include support for parent-child visits, sometimes even active coaching of parent-child visits. And therapeutic work should include the clinician's input on transitions as when children are moved from one foster home to another or who are being reunified with their parents. Therapists working with children in foster care should try to promote a working relationship between the parent and the foster parent. Often there's conflict and sometimes even hostility, and that puts the child in the middle of a pretty contentious situation. There are several, well, not several, there are some evidence-based psychotherapies that are particularly well-suited to young children in foster care including child-parent psychotherapy, and also attachment and biobehavioral catch-up, which actually started specifically as an intervention for children in foster care and has become more generally applicable. In New York City, is being delivered in a widespread way through the organization called Power of Two. There are many therapeutic tools that we can use with young children in foster care, including several very on-target picture books, some written by um, Sandra uh, ghosh Ethan, including You Weren't With Me and Once I Was Very Scared, but there are many. Um, some of you may know that Sesame Street now has a character who's in foster care, Carly, and her for now family, uh, which kind of normalizes and opens up the topic of foster care for young children. And for children with incarcerated parents, um, there are some other good therapeutic tools, including one put out by Sesame Street, uh, which is distributed free of charge, and other picture books, including one called Visiting Day, which describes the child's visit with an uncle who's incarcerated. Okay, um, moving on to a discussion now of differential diagnosis. Many childhood disorders share similar symptoms. We see tantrums, aggression, and overactivity as common examples in many different childhood disorders. In order to know which diagnosis best captures and describes the child's symptoms, Clinicians have to synthesize information from multiple sources, including clinical interviews, observations, and the use of measures. Knowing the norms of development help us differentiate what is typical from what is problematic. Um, and I'll, I'll note here that comorbidities are common, so sometimes children have more than one diagnosis. A lot of this comes to how we 
be our clinical case formulation, how we understand the child's history, current circumstances, symptoms, and how we put this together in our biopsychosocial models of clinical formulation. To help us with this, um, um, I'll mention some tools that we use in screening and assessment. This is by no means a comprehensive list, um, just some things that are handy and readily available um, and not that difficult to use. Um, Gil and I always recommend that any clinical assessment has some developmental screening or assessment as part of it to rule in or to rule out some of the developmental problems we've both spoken about earlier in these webinars. Ages and Stages is a widely used, um, readily available uh, instrument that also comes in multiple languages and helps clinicians screen for children's developmental competencies. There's a social emotional edition of Ages and Stages which focuses more specifically on the social emotional domain. The MCHAT is a screening for autism spectrum disorder, um, which I now believe is incorporated into well baby um, checkups uh, and can be used really by anybody. It's also um, available free of charge, usually used somewhere at about 18 months of age. The short sensory profile two is a screener for sensory um, processing disorders. Uh, I believe that most of you are familiar with the PHQ-9, which is a screen for um, parental depression. It's a screen for depression in general, used in our context as a screen for parental depression. There's also the Beck depression screen, which is a similar tool, and there's a Beck anxiety screen. In terms of assessment of the parent-child relationship, um, those measures are often kind of complex to administer and to score. But two that are not difficult to administer or score is the Piccolo and the Keys to Interactive Parenting, sometimes abbreviated as KIPS. We'd be happy to take any questions about these measures. If knowing more about them would be helpful. The good news is that there are effective and evidence-based interventions for all of the disorders we've discussed in this webinar. And increasingly, these interventions are available for children and families in New York. In most cases, the most effective interventions for very young children are those that are relationship-based and include the child's parent or caregiver. Okay. Gil and I have both spoken about treating to the relationship. When we talk about treating to the relationship, um, it includes these, these kinds of components. First of all, honoring the importance of the parent-child relationship. In our work with parents, we have to underscore that this is the most important relationship the child has. It's always helpful and important to acknowledge and support the parent's strengths, to comment when they're particularly supportive or facilitative of the child's emotional um, or overall development. Treating to the relationship definitely involves addressing the parent's concerns, whether they feel um, well matched to the child we're seeing before us or not. It's our way to connect with the parent and develop therapeutic alliance with them. Treating to the relationship sometimes involves providing psychoeducation about appropriate expectations for the child's age, about children's individual differences, and about developmentally supportive ways to promote children's positive behaviors. We help to impart new skills by coaching parents in their interactions with their child, coming to this coaching from a very strength-based and positive as I said earlier, we assist parents in developing insight into the impact of their parenting, of the parenting they received on their parenting now, and that's really important. Again, we promote parents' reflective functioning and ability to understand their children's feelings. 
And we're guided by Julie Paul, um, who said both, how you are is as important as what you do, and do unto others as you would have others do unto others. Those are always very good perspectives to keep in mind in treating to the relationship. There are many intervention models for very young children and their parents or caregivers. I've, I've listed a few, child parent psychotherapy being a very important one, but also including parent-child interaction therapy or PCIT. I've already mentioned attachment and biobehavioral catch-up. The DIR model is also very relationally focused, incredible years, Circles of Security, Triple P, Parenting Spares, which is an intervention for parents who have had traumatic histories, Healthy Steps, which is a relational intervention embedded into primary care, Nurse Family Partnership, which focuses on parent-infant relationships for first-time mothers um, and is widely available in New York City and is a gold standard home visiting program, but we're also rich in the city with other home visiting programs that cover similar territories, including healthy families, parent-child home, and others. I'll end with the fact that there are many promising developments in the still rel relatively young field of infant mental health. There is increasing recognition that even the youngest child can have social, emotional, and mental health disorders that can derail their development and adaptive functioning. There is, as I just said, an increase in evidence-backed and relationship-based models of intervention. We're seeing increased screening for social, emotional problems in primary pediatrics, in early care and education, and other child-serving systems. There are more mandates for screening and better opportunities for reimbursement for screenings. Thereby, we're seeing increased screening for maternal depression. We're seeing an increased attention to social emotional, the social emotional domain by early intervention. The use of DC005 is being increasingly approved by Medicaid in different states and is a source of advocacy among private insurance plans. We're seeing an increased use of early childhood mental health consultation in preschools and child care settings, increased supports via children's pediatric providers, and of course, the New York City Early Childhood Mental Health Network. So that is the end of my presentation, and we're happy that we have a good amount of time uh, for any questions that might have come in uh, during this webinar or the ones that preceded it. And thank you. So before we dive into questions, I just I want to thank you, Susan, and also Gil, our wonderful presenters on this series. I know Evelyn is probably going to jump in here as well um, and, and offer facilitation of the questions, but I just wanted to remind folks that before the webinar concludes today, our colleague uh, Kevin is going to chat out the feedback survey. Um, he'll send it through the chat box functionality, and we just ask that you take a few minutes, there's not many questions, and just um, fill out the feedback survey. It does allow us to understand your experience and really update and tailor and improve our TTAC offerings as we move forward. So just a little reminder and plug for the survey. And with that, I'm going to ask um, if Evelyn or Susan and Gil, I'm not sure if you want to dive in on questions or how we'd like to get started today. Great. So this is Evelyn, and let me jump in with some of the questions here. And I really appreciate the fact that people have been so interactive here, and we're hoping to get through all of them. And just to say that if we don't get to questions, we will certainly respond individually to people around questions that were submitted. Um, just one theme that keeps coming up is people are interested in references. You will see on the last slide that there are citations for all of the references that we've uh, used throughout the webinar. So, um, if there's anything that you don't see there, please feel free just to reach out to us. So the first question today is, can you elaborate on the signs of underlying stress that children of dismissive parents may show? 
that children of abusive parents, is that what you said? Submissive, submissive parents may show. You well, you know, then there's no one set of symptoms. Um, it certainly depends on uh, lots of things. Um, but children who have uh, been abused often show um, depression, negative mood, difficulties in their relationships with other children or with other adults. Um, you know, again, it's, it's so variable. It depends on the severity and chronicity of the abuse, the presence of other supportive adults. Um, but I would say that some of those that I've mentioned uh, are common. You know, again, we know that abuse is a form of interpersonal trauma, so it makes children worry of the relationship and of whether their needs can be met or whether anybody will be protective of them. Uh, you know, and then it also, you know, it depends on what it's superimposed on the child's temperament and uh, many other things. But I think some of the things I described are things that we commonly see. Again, I'd be happy to talk more individually if there were more specific concerns about a particular child or, or circumstance. Uh, Susan, Great this thing. is uh, Gil. Uh, uh, I just wanted to jump in about that question, if I might. You yes. know, the parent who is consistently dismissive of the child does, I think, put that child and that diet at risk for um, an attachment problem uh, that is we sometimes call an avoidant attachment. Because the message that the parent, sort of chronically dismissive parent sends to the child is, I'm not here for you. You better take care of yourself, grow yourself up. And it communicates um, to the child that they better be possibly self-sufficient uh, beyond their years and, and, and their capability. Now, of course, that's a risk. And as Susan said, all of this is individual. But um, that that is one uh, focus that a chronically dismissive style might um, be at risk for. Great, thank you. So another question is that we always mention depression when we're talking to chi about child attachment disruption. And the question is, what about other mental health disorders? And is depression the most damaging of all mental health disorders for attachment disorders? Well, that's a great question because um, it highlights an omission that's often made in that anxiety is also a very difficult emotion uh, for children to experience in their parents. So we do focus on depression, possibly because there's much more of a research base for that. Um, but parental anxiety, which often is concomitant with depression, is also a difficult circumstance for children. Um, so I think that it's a good question for highlighting that. Listen, any mental health problems, certainly the more significant and serious ones, schizophrenia and other, you know, bipolar disorder, you know, just only escalate with the children as the nature of psychopathology gets more severe. Um, I think the focus on depression has to do with the research base, um, but really almost any form of mental illness is a risk factor in early caregiving. If I can just jump okay. in, I think in, in general, I think the question you have to ask yourself, does the mental health disorder render the parent emotionally unavailable to the child and in what amounts and what doses. And I think because emotional, well, of course, physical availability, but emotional availability is such a key component um, to healthy development. I think that question is one you might ask in reference to any mental health disorder on the part of the parent. Yes, of course, and I would also add that the other uh, factor is what, who else is available to the child, what's the support system like, and what exposure to other caregivers does the child have in conjunction. Terrific. Okay, so somebody asked, if we had been working in a home visiting setting with mothers who had been experiencing postpartum depression, how can we best support those mothers while working remotely during the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, I, I am not providing direct clinical 
but I am uh, very in touch with lots and lots of clinicians who are. Um, and what I'm hearing is that the work is translatable into telehealth visits. We certainly can't do everything you can do in an in, in-person visit, but I was on the phone yesterday with Nurse Family Partnership Leadership, um, and certainly in my own family project. Uh, I'm hearing how um, telehealth visits are allowing for contact with parents, for crisis intervention, for psychoeducation, just for general emotional support. Um, throughout this crisis. So as home visitors, uh, there's still an important role you can play. And um, mental health treatment providers, clinics that serve people with depression are also still working under those circumstances, maybe not all of them, um, but we're finding many mental health clinics that are operating. So I think we can still be quite effective in supporting parents with depression, either by our own supportive um, work with them and or by connecting them to uh, the resources that we connect to uh, under more usual circumstances. I think this is Gil. I think an important dimension is as much as possible to be consistent and predictable in, as you can be during this time in uh, scheduling appointments, being there, uh, and uh, letting the parent know that uh, they can rely on you. Reliability, I think, is an important feature. Very important point. Um, can you talk a little bit about exposure to intimate partner violence in early childhood and how that impacts on the mother-child diet? The big one, the big one, again, depending on the chronicity of the problem, uh, but interpersonal violence is one of the things that we can consider um, part of the ideology of complex trauma. When you have parents who are violent with each other, um, the child really doesn't have an adult that they can uh, rely on. There's one perpetrating parent who obviously doesn't have the child's emotional needs front and center, and then there's a victimized parent who's often really struggling. Um, so the child is really caught in a circumstance where neither partner uh, is prioritizing or is able to prioritize, or at least most of the time, the emotional needs of the child. It's it's very traumatic experience for young children. Interpersonal violence has a lot of um, components to it, including a sensory, very frightening sensory component of screaming and crashing and very overwhelming for a young child from a sensory perspective and certainly from an attachment perspective. Dyads who are engaged, couples who are engaged in that kind of relationship and have young children really should be directed to some kind of um, intervention. Um, Susan, you have far, much, far more experience in that area than I, uh, but I just, but this, so this is more theoretical, but um, I think the question here is um, how much is the child in the middle uh, of this kind of domestic violence and does that put them in a very compromised position? And also there is a concept called identification with the aggressor. This is a defense that um, all of us might use in a, in a, in a situation of uh, aggression and, and violence. And um, the idea is that we identify with the perpetrator uh, in a way to uh, spare us from becoming the object. But if the child identifies with the aggressor and that becomes part of their sort of internal uh, life, uh, it increases the risk that they may become a perpetrator themselves. That's a great point, Bill, and I'm glad that you added that. Um, I just want to get back to the question, uh, or the, the way you introduce what you were just going to say in terms of it depends on how much the child is in the middle of all of this. And I'm just going to say that based on experience, parents often underestimate the extent to which children are exposed or in the middle. We hear over and over again, the child was sleeping in the other room when this episode occurred. Um, I can tell you based on working with many children, 
testify that that is an underestimate of their exposure. You cannot sleep as a young child when they're crashing and screaming um, in the other room. Uh, children are much more aware of this kind of uh, behavior than parents sometimes do. Sometimes parents may really think the kids were not exposed. They think they're in another room, they're sleeping, or sometimes parents say that as their own defense around the guilt um, related to the harm that they know their kids have been exposed to. Thank you. So there's a question, and I'll take this one, and it says, is DC Zero to Five being approved in New York State? And I just want to say that the New York State Office of Mental Health is actively working with the Department of Health to recommend that DC Zero to Five be the recommended diagnostic tool for children birth to five. And again, we think this is a significant improvement in the sense that it's really looking at what's unique about young children and really takes into account their relationships and the psychosocial um, situations in which children find themselves. So we're very excited about it. Um, OMH has been sponsoring trainings, which New York Center for Child Development, along with uh, McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research, have been hosting throughout the state, and they will continue into next year. And uh, just from my perspective, I think not only is it a fantastic diagnostic tool, but it also really provides a conceptual framework about how to think about young kids, taking into context some of the other relational factors and developmental issues, which are often overlooked with young children. Uh, so another question, does a developmental trauma disorder currently exist? And if so, does Medicaid reimburse for it? And are clinicians advocating for it? So that's a great question. It really looked for a while that that classification might take hold. There was advocacy to include developmental trauma disorder in the revision uh, in the DSM, most recent revision for DSM-5. It did not, it did not get accepted for that. The feeling was that there wasn't enough of a research base, which was a little questionable because there's a lot of research. Um, so we do not have the formal designation designation of developmental trauma disorder, but I like to bring that up because it drives home the fact that um, complex trauma does affect children across so many different domains of development. Um, instead, complex trauma has become adopted really not so much in the diagnostic categories, but in the field, and um, children who have diagnoses of complex trauma have some entitlements now. They're entitled to home health home. It's considered one of those um, risks that entitle children to um, home health home and other mental health services. So, um, yeah, we didn't get to adopt developmental trauma disorder into our museology, but again, I think it's a very good descriptive way to think about it. Okay, Susan, I'm wondering if you could speak to the impact of separating sibling, siblings who are removed from parents. And uh, this person noted that at times a sibling has been a principal attachment figure um, and not the parent. It's a problem. It's a problem for many reasons. Siblings are often an enormous source of emotional support for children. Um, social support, emotional support, they are their longest attachments very often. <clears throat> Separating siblings is something that clinicians uh, certainly would not recommend. And I think that even the child welfare system <clears throat> appreciates and understands to some extent. Um, sometimes it is done uh, because children have different parents or grandparents. You know, sometimes children are half siblings and they have different resources available to them for ongoing care, and people don't want to deprive those children of that. Uh, permanent kind of resource, you know, a grandparent or a father of one, but not these other children. Sometimes it's done for that reason. Um, I've often seen it also occur, of course, just if it's a big sibling group and no one foster home can take all those kids. Sometimes that happens. That's always a sad kind of, um, all of these are sad separations. Um, in some circumstances, I've seen siblings be separated when there's one particular child um, who's so hard to care for that the children have circulated between many, many foster homes. And if there are siblings who are easier to care for, whose foster families are happy to provide permanent care for, but one child um, 
can't be taken care of that way. Sometimes, you know, after there have been so many removals and replacements, people advocate for keeping the siblings who can be stable in stable situations. But it's always, it's always a heart-wrenching decision to separate siblings. It's, it's right up there with separating children from parents. Siblings are long sources of support to most of us, and um, can only, that can only happen under the most you know, very special and egregious circumstances. Yeah, and I think that yesterday there were several questions as well about um, you know, the impact of multiple disruptions and transitions. And one of the questions was, can your primary attachment figure switch through your childhood, for example, from a foster parent to a parent, and would it switch even if the secondary caregiver is not protective, or would the attachment remain with whomever has protective custody? So a lot of concerns about disruptive attachments for children and the implication on attachment. Yes, I think well, we, Susan and I responded to that question in writing. Uh, and Susan has much more experience than I in uh, uh, issues of foster care and multiple placement. But just as a rule of thumb, and I, this is again, uh, my mentor Sally Province used to say, um, as much as possible, we want constancy of caregiver, consistency of caregiving, and predictability of place. Constancy of caregiver, consistency of caregiving, and predictability of place. So yeah, I mean that's what to strive for. Um, children can, though, develop attachment uh, to more than one person. Uh, we all have multiple attachments in our lives, um, and children whose caregivers change um, can develop new attachments to their new caregiver. Um, really, what we're talking about uh, was in part of your question when you asked about a less protective parent, the children really become attached to anybody who takes care of them. That's necessary. That's part of their survival. It's the quality of the attachment that we are then dealing with uh, when a parent is not protective. So yes, when children have had secure attachments, they can more readily transfer their attachment, their positive expectations of relationships to a new caregiver. And when children have had insecure attachments, they are more wary of the next caregiver. Um, you know, a lot depends, as we said earlier in the webinar, on what the attachment frame of mind of the caregivers are. If a child who's had um, abusive care ends up in foster care with a more uh, nurturing parent, that parent can help transition a child from an insecure attachment to a more secure attachment, uh, vice versa. So all children become attached, except under the most extreme circumstances, it's the quality of attachment. Um, and you can have different types of attachments with different caregivers. You can be securely attached to one caregiver and insecurely attached to another. There's lots of complexity in your questions, um, but yes, children can transfer attachments. They don't really transfer attachments, they form new attachments. Um, and a lot depends on the nature of that relationship, of both relationships. And right. uh, somebody uh, said that this is a great, great presentation and uh, explaining how to uh, excuse me, before we go to the next question, Evelyn, I'd just like to add, uh, you know, there are three basic qualities that seem to promote a secure attachment. Sensitivity, meaning that the caregiver is able to read the child's cues and, and have a sense of what the child needs. Responsivity, that with some contingency, the caregiver and, and consistency, the caregiver can respond to those emotional and physical needs and reliability that the caregiving is consistent. Great, okay, somebody said this was a great presentation in explaining how parents' early upbringing affects their parenting style when they have their own. This person works in foster care and their question is that birth parents tend to be non-compliant with therapy and often feel that they don't need it. What is the best approach to working with them? I'll start with the non-compliant, with the word non-compliant, um, because 
that's an interpretation that often can be reformulated. Um, sometimes parents are told where they need to go and when they should go. Parents need a voice um, in determining what would be helpful to them and then determining how and where they'd like to get that support. Um, many of our parents in foster care have had very traumatic um, backgrounds and many disappointing relationships, and they're wary about mental health. Sometimes they've had lots of bad experiences. So I think we need to take a deeper dive um, when we're mm -hmm. trying to get mental health or other supportive care, uh, services into a more strength-based conversation with the parents about what that parent thinks they need, how they'd like to get that help, where they'd like to get that help. Because when we impose those, um, those circumstances on parents, um, sometimes there are even impractical issues like the location or hours of service delivery. So all I'm saying is that let's try to reframe the non-compliance understanding into understanding how to help parents feel more part of the decision making, um, say what they think they need, uh, and work in a more collaborative way with um, all of us in, in figuring out how to get their, those needs met. Um, you know, there's so many reasons related to um, avoidance of dealing with your traumatic past, uh, lack of trust of people or mental health services, and we have to acknowledge people's previous experiences, things like that. I think being a more collaborative partner with the parent and resolving those issues uh, might result in a different outcome. It might not, but it might. Yeah, I, I just want to say there's no magic bullet, but you know, so many of the families we work with have had multiple losses in their lives, complex trauma, as Susan has talked about, um, unavailability or inconsistency of caregiving in their lives. And I think one important thing to keep in mind is uh, our role as a new object who can offer the families a new kind of experience and a corrective emotional experience. And I think being predictable, being there even in a sense when the parent isn't, letting them know you were there, being persisting in uh, continuing to reach out to the parent. Um, I think this can be <clears throat> very important and demonstrate to the parent that we're different than possibly other people in their lives have been. And something that I think is maybe easier to do in private practice, but uh, always tr I've always tried to give clients a particular hour on a particular day and let them know that is their time that is exclusively and specially for them. And it is, you know, it's almost like it's indelible in my calendar. I think that gives uh, some clients an incredible sense of belonging and a kind of psychological, uh, a bit of a psychological home. Terrific. So what are some strategies that you use to provide psychoeducation to parents on issues such as maternal depression uh, while being careful to make sure that the parent doesn't feel blamed? I think we can talk about how treatable depression is. Um, we, there are lots of both uh, psychotherapeutic and medication approaches um, to depression that really are very impactful. We don't want to necessarily uh, share all the research on the um, adverse impact on children's brain development, but we do want to stress the fact that parents don't have to feel punished. Um, it's a circumstance that can change. Um, and to point out moments when the parents positive or positive interaction with their parents, you know, um, you know, to point out good interactions that the child seems to be responding to. So again, we keep that information about the pernicious effects in our back pocket, and we focus on the Treatability of depression, the fact that the parent does not have to feel, because depression is not a comfortable experience to live with. So we provide hope that the parents don't have to feel that way forever. Um, and we point out whenever the child has had a 
good um, response to the parents, you know, brighter aspects or, you know, more contingent responses. And that's where I would start. So here's another question. Which tools are used to assess the parent-child attachment? Well, attachment, um, formal attachment is measured usually using um, a set of procedures called the strain situation. That is usually a laboratory-based assessment that's not so readily available in clinical work. Um, look up the strain situation. There's lots on YouTube. Um, it is a set of procedures uh, that are used to the child response to a brief separation from the parent, the introduction of a stranger, um, and that, that's really the only means I know about to establish children's attachment classification. However, there are instruments that measure other qualities of the parent-child relationship that relate to attachment, the things that Gil described, how, um, you know, how much the parent responds to the child's cues, how emotionally available they are. Um, some of the instruments that I m mentioned on the slide that I showed, the piccolo and the keys to interactive parenting, most specifically, are more accessible to clinicians to learn to use. And again, they don't necessarily measure the attachment, but they measure a lot of underlying parent behaviors that contribute to children's attachment classifications. So I'd look at those. The Piccolo is particularly usable. The key to interactive parenting does require some videotaping, but it's not onerous videotaping. Um, it does require uh, coding and training on coding. Um, it's a little bit uh, more complicated than the Piccolo, but it's very usable and it's being used uh, by a lot of clinical programs today. Yeah, I, I think that the, the strange situation is still the gold standard from um, any kind of a research perspective. There are some other uh, kinds of measures. There's a Q-sort measure where um, you ask the parent their, their qualitative statements about the relationship and you ask them to sort them into different categories. Uh, that has uh, some, some validity. A clinical tool that's useful is the CROWL. Um, and it's really a structured uh, interview where you ask the parent and child to uh, be, go into a playroom that is a, a very standard environment and you ask the parent to play with the child, their child as they might do at home. You ask the parent to teach the child something. You have uh, one object in the room that's kind of a forbidden no touch object. So if the child approaches it, you get an idea how the parent uh, sets limits and disciplines the child, and part of the crowd then is a separation and reunion experience so that you get a little bit of that um, uh, reunion uh, quality. Terrific. So we're going to take one more question, and uh, this is so relevant to what's going on in all of our lives right now, but how can we help with social-emotional development during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic? Um, I'll start. Um, actually, the question you just posed is slightly different than the question, same question that we looked at last night, and that this is think social emotional development. So I'll start with the fact that we need to be honest and forthcoming with our children, even our young children, about what's going on around all of us. Um, certainly, we can be responsive to their questions about it, Young, even the youngest children appreciate that things have changed a lot. Uh, parents are home, they're not going out, they're not seeing their friends, there might be tensions in families um, as they attempt to meet multiple needs. So I think when we talk about social emotional development at this time, um, parents' emotional availability and sensitivity to what their children are experiencing um, is one very helpful thing. And some of some of you may come across, there are at least three books that I've come across, the very young children, picture books, um, that address the crisis that might be helpful here, and we can send you the names and the references to those. Um, the question that was posed last night, as I understood it, had more to do with children's social development. Um, 
And so, you know, I responded how it's, um, you know, it's part time because none of us are doing the kind of socializing that we're doing, um, but still helping children with emotion understanding and emotion identification is um, a very important way to always help children with their social development, helping them to understand the perspectives of others. Um, we can do that as we talk with our children, as we read to them and, and think about stories together or as we watch something. So, um, you know, for general emotional support, I've been dealing with children's fears around this pandemic or um, anxieties. And in terms of social development, using any opportunity um, that presents to help children understand the world through multiple different perspectives. And I just want to add, interact with your child. Interact with your child. Remember, two-way communication is so critical. Uh, and, and, and also play. Play, remember, is self-curative, and it is children's natural way to communicate and to learn. So play with your children during this time. Well, on that note, I just want to thank our presenters. This has been such a comprehensive and informative uh, uh, series here, and I'm really glad we had time for questions, and I appreciate everybody chatting in your questions. So. Thank you to all. And again, you can go to our website for upcoming trainings. We thank you for joining us and we look forward to you joining us in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.